All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is BXGS Weekly, episode 67. Bringing you all the best JavaScript news of the week in a podcast form. And uh, yeah, it is, um, it's gonna be a bit of an easygoing one because we don't really have that many things happening. Seems like people are going into vacations, but we do have some pretty neat uh, getting started articles, some really good articles to discuss, and then, you know, more in depth ones, and quite a bit of uh, minor announcements and tips and tricks, I would say. We also got a few releases that are relatively major. And uh, yeah, demo section is looking a bit uh, lackluster this time around, but um, you know what, let's just get started. So first of all, we got the getting started section, which is uh, the first article here is building a GraphQL and React app with TypeScript. A pretty nice tutorial on how to build your first React application with GraphQL and TypeScript. Specifically, it doesn't talk, it doesn't focus on the back end, it only focuses on the front end. So you're going to be using React and Apollo by querying the public SpaceX uh, GraphQL API. If you ever wanted to get into GraphQL but didn't want to set up your server, or maybe you know you're just working with the front ends, then this article got you covered basically. So it got everything you need to know to get started. So that sounds interesting. Do check it out. Next article we got here is what is an abstract syntax tree? Um, so a pretty nice introduction to ASTs, uh, why you should care about them and how do you start working with them. So if you ever, for example, wanted to write a Babel plugin, uh, then this article is for you. It will basically explain what the AST is, how do you work with it and how does it actually generate it from the code. Uh, I mean, it's a relatively straightforward format. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Next article we got here is interactive D3JS, uh, sorry, interactive charts with D3JS. A really cool introduction to essentially D3JS and the interactive charts. Um, what I want to note is the way that it's structured actually. So in the end, you're going to be building a pretty basic chart that has a tooltip that shows the data, you know, additionally, whenever you hover over it, which is super straightforward. But the article is really like split on step by step basis. And all of those steps are outlined together with code and correlated to your currently, uh, basically the current text that you are reading, which makes it really, really neat. So if you are getting started with D3JS, if you or maybe you wanted to get started with it, and it looks a bit intimidating, because I know it might be it's it's a pretty complex library. Uh, this article is absolutely amazing to get started with it and you know to uh, do a pretty basic nice D3GS chart. So there we go. Next article we got here is create a custom use fetch react hook. This is a tutorial on building your own use fetch hook that will basically fetch the data handle the loading state handle the errors and all that kind of stuff. If you're already working with react hooks, uh, you probably won't find anything new in here. But if you are getting started, and you were confused as to how you build your own custom hook, then this is a pretty good starting point. So do check it out. Next article we got here is how to use the web share API. So there's a tutorial for as you might imagine the web share API that has been around for well, some time, it's not exactly widespread. It's only available in basically two browsers, uh, Safari and Chrome on Android specifically. So Chrome on desktop does not support it. And in fact, on desktop only Safari supports it, which is a bit strange, but there we go. Uh, but yeah, it is there. And if you're coding the progressive app apps for Android and iOS, um, it's quite nice. It works really well. For example, Twitter progressive app app has it and it's quite handy to use on mobiles. And this tutorial teaches you how exactly to use it in a pretty basic manner. Like, I mean, it's it's a very straightforward API, but you know, it's a very good tutorial for it. Right, next thing we got here is when should you be using web workers, a pretty nice tutorial and slash introduction to web workers. Why are they important? And when do you need to use them? Uh, it's also sort of put into perspective of uh, JavaScript development on mobile devices specifically which uh, is also quite interesting. So I never actually compared the um, single core benchmarks for the mobile devices. And there is an incredible gap between the, you know, the bleeding edge devices like iPhone XS and Galaxy S9 Plus, and a mid tier and low tier devices like Moto G7 and Nokia 2. Like the gap is insane. It's almost tenfold for the low end devices uh, compared to the iPhone XS, which is just mind blowing. 
And yeah, you know, that means that the uh, web workers and not hogging the main thread is more important than ever. And uh, there's basically a few code snippets that will show you how exactly you can use them. Um, bare bones and then how you can use them with the libraries like comlink that simplify the working and then how you can debug it uh, using dev tools to see exactly uh, what happens when you tap on things and how does the processing happen. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. It is actually quite good. Right, next thing we got here is error handling, the missing piece of your Node.js architecture. Introduction to error handling in Node.js, basically everything you ever wanted to know about error handling, how do you properly handle them? How do you manage them on runtime? How, what do you do with errors in production and stuff like this? So you're just getting started with Node.js or maybe you've been working for some time but was not quite sure how to handle the errors, then this article is for you. Next thing we got here is how to do scroll linked animations the right way. So a pretty in-depth dive into or deep dive into the scroll linked animations, which is the parallax, for example, one of the examples, um, you know, stuff like this. Uh, it's a pretty nice write up on uh, importance of doing it optimally using stuff like intersection observer, using CSS properties to make it seem, um, smooth, right? So this is the right word, uh, because if you do it wrong, your animations would look choppy. And this is not something you want, because it basically breaks user experience. So this article covers all the important, uh, bleh, let me try that again, all the important parts that you have to keep in mind when working with the scroll length animations. Right, uh, next thing we got here is why um, array from 1, 7 and 11 as in strings dot map parse int returns one, not a number three in JavaScript. Now, if you have been working with JavaScript for quite some time, this question should be uh, obvious to you, right? But if you are just getting started and if you are like on a junior level, I guess, it might confuse you at first because you would think, okay, you know, we're mapping over strings with numbers using parse int and you would expect the output to be one, seven and 11, right? But that's not exactly what happens. And again, if you've been using JavaScript for quite some time and you know exactly the map function works and how the parse int works, you will know immediately what the problem is here. If you don't, then I would um, encourage you to read the article because it does a very good job at explaining why this happens and what you should keep in mind when using map and parse int essentially. So um, yeah, there you go. All right, um, I think this is the last article we got for getting started today. This is an article titled CSRF in action, uh, cross site request forgery. So it's like one of the, um, as the um, intro says, one of the most popular ways of exploiting a server and it basically um, attacks by sending a request from another domain to your backend, right? And if your backend, has the course headers and accepts course from everyone, then you basically have a problem because the browser will just put the cookies in there from the uh, authenticated user and then you can do whatever the hell you want. So this article introduces the CSRF uh, attack itself and how you can mitigate it by using CSRF tokens and uh, course, um, course options, I guess, right? Because I, I would say that it is almost never a good idea to use course star as in, you know, allow course for every domain, because that might lead to some like problems like CSRF, right? Uh, so you actually want to set course to the specific domains that you know your request will be coming to, but then you don't really have to care about uh, CSRF. But yeah, if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Okay, now we are coming to the article section. We actually do have quite a bit of pretty interesting articles that, uh, yeah, we might talk a bit about. I guess there's like three or four that I, I think we are good to discuss. So the first one we got here is the problem with web components. A pretty interesting write up with, you know, outlooks on why, why exactly web components are not the golden savior and the replacement for the existing JavaScript frameworks that we have like React, Vue or Angular or whatever, right? So the author here talks about the uh, shortcomings of the web components. First, that they are constraining, which is, I mean, on one hand, it's kind of what they are supposed to do, right? Because they're supposed to be constrained, self-sufficient, uh, isolated things. But on the other hand, they are a bit too constraining because for example, you cannot use CSS pseudo selectors with them. So you cannot select 
uh, web components using those selectors for some reason. You cannot use them with native elements and their associated APIs. So like you cannot extend HTML button element. You will have to create your own button by extending element and then doing everything button actually already does, right? So there's like some limitations here basically. Maybe this is due to web components being like very early spec, essentially spec one version O, maybe version 2.0, we get them a bit better. But for now, you know, they are very constraining. They are not widely supported. So this is absolutely true. The custom elements and a bunch of other things that you actually need for the browser to support web components are still, well, not, but, well, to say not everywhere is to say nothing because there's like literally Firefox and Chrome are two browsers, two only browsers that support them completely, right? And uh, uh, I mean, I guess it's okay because Chrome is like what 60% of the market and then Firefox is another five to 10. And then you got Safari, which is another major player and Safari actually doesn't support them completely. And while it can polyfill it, it's like, it's, you know, it's, it's always pain in the ass to go with the polyfills and feature detection, all that kind of stuff. So it is a bit annoying. Um, another interesting point the author makes is that they are easily misunderstood and misused. So the point he gives here is that, okay, so you actually can have a web component that is a wrapper for a table that does something, right? But then you want to have uh, two other components. For example, you want to have a sortable table and expandable rows that are do different things to the same table. It's actually way harder to compose those than the ones, for example, working with React, right? So in React doing something like this, would be trivial, really. And in web components, that actually brings a major headache. So if you ever tried working with web components, if you ever tried to make them composable, man, this is a completely separate subset of issues, basically. And the last point here is, or I guess last few points here is that you can't just drop them into applications. So you can't just, you know, include it and that's it. So there's actually additional things you need to set up for them to work, including the polyfilling if you need to work with the older browsers. And um, the sort of the summary of all this article comes down to the using framework agnostic components without web components. That is something that, I mean, it's something that we've been doing for quite some time, right? Is that we didn't call them web components or we didn't call them components, but this is something that existed for quite some time and there's a bunch of things that, you know, we could do like just include a JavaScript file and then run a function on top of the query selector table to just create the same table that is sortable and that is expandable, right? So this is really straightforward. It works. And uh, yeah, it's like, the thing is that it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting discussion because on one hand, web components is a really cool initiative because having a way to natively build reusable components on web is extremely helpful, right? On the other hand, the current state is so, so raw that it's really hard to use them in a real environment. Like, right, when you're building an app, web components are typically not enough because they don't give you all the primitives you need to build a proper app. While the frameworks like React or Vue or Angular actually give you a lot more than just components. So it's, it's an interesting discussion. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of curious to see uh, how, how this whole, you know, web components thing will end up being, I guess, because I know, I think there was an announcement that they're working on a new version of a spec recently, if I remember correctly. So I'm kind of curious to see how this will end up and whether this will be uh, dropped or changed or expanded into something more than that. But yeah, um, Donna, thank you very much for the donation. Uh, thank you for your continued support as always highly appreciated. Okay, next big article we got here is micro frontends from the Martin Fowler blog. And uh, this one is also <laughs> something that's been echoing on Twitter for last week, I think. So the, um, the idea of micro frontends have been around for at least a couple of years. I think even more, I think the first time I've heard about them was like 2012 or something. Uh, I guess basically, you know, the same spot when the microservices became popular. The idea of micro frontends is quite uh, straightforward. Uh, so you have your microservices, right? That do different things. And then to interact with these microservices, you have micro frontends that 
work specifically with one of the microservices. And uh, yeah, it's as a lot of discussion on Twitter ended up, this is not actually a technical thing or a technical issue, although it does bring a set of its own technical challenges along with it. It's more of a solution to organizational issue. You know, how do we figure out? So we have a team that works on microservice A and there's a team that works on a front end for it. And then there's a team that works on microservice B and there's a team that works on front end for it. How do we organize them in a way that they can actually uh, effectively work together? And this article does a very good job of, um, I guess, uh, giving an overview of what the micro front ends are, what are the benefits, what are the example of the micro front ends, and what are the integrational approaches to them. So because, you know, there's a bunch of different ways you can organize them. Micro front ends doesn't necessarily mean that they are deployed as separate applications. It actually can mean that you integrate them on server side using template composition, or you integrate them on build time using React components, or you do it on runtime using iframes, or you do it on runtime using uh, JavaScript, or you do it on runtime using web components, which is, I guess, one of the you know modern ways of doing that. So there's a lot of they do bring a lot of very interesting challenges uh, along with them, but yeah, it's it's more more of a as I already mentioned, organizational thing than anything uh, anything else. Hey Kevin, welcome to the stream. So that sounds interesting. Uh, do check the article out as it is very detailed, very curious, and again, you know, I guess if you're working with microservices, I would highly recommend uh, looking into this one. If not, then that might not be as interesting for you. Nonetheless, a pretty cool topic, so quite highly recommended. Next article we got here is you probably don't need reCAPTCHA. Um, look into the reCAPTCHA and why is it considered harmful? I mean, the, you know, the typical stuff like, okay, we got the Google tracking everything and there's annoyances uh, such as, you know, it works poorly in non-Google browsers, let's just put it this way, like Firefox and there's like, a lot of things related to it. Like, for example, if you're not logged into Google, you're going to have problems with it, so on and so forth. Now, this is not the interesting bit, right? There's been, I think there's been discussed for a long time. And there's like a lot of, I think majority of people are aware of the downsides of reCAPTCHA. Now, the interesting thing here is the uh, section called CAPTCHAs are not always necessary. So the CAPTCHA is typically used to combat the uncustomized spam, right? Because if, if it's a custom spam that is tailored for your website, then it is highly likely that somebody actually is doing it by hand, which is annoying, but you know, stopping humans, your captures are not gonna help you. Now, captures are primarily to combat the bots, right? And uh, the interesting thing here is that the author gives some pretty cool numbers, um, like for example, hidden form elements static questions that are always the same and always have the same answer, um, they are good enough to stop 99% of the bots, which was very, like, it's, it's absolutely interesting. So just by doing a hidden element that just says something that bot would feel like, you know, a form name that says, okay, here's a first name, and you hide it with CSS, that will stop 99% of the bots. Just think how stupid they are. This is absolutely incredible. There is also some very cool examples of captures. Like I think this one has been around in internet for ages. Like, yeah, there's like a differential equation here. Solve it for X. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess that works. You know, if you're a mathematical forum, um, there's also like anime examples. Select all images with the girls over age of 30, which is like, I <laughs> I'm not even sure that's possible. And uh, yeah, there's a bunch of other things which is also quite interesting. So if you are managing a website that uh, have to protect uh, stuff, I guess, protect the submissions from bots, then you might not need reCAPTCHA. And uh, yeah, I would highly recommend reading this article. I guess like there's one of the caveats that author mentions that it is, you know, if you get big enough to be a target, uh, to be targeted by bots essentially, then your this kind of uh, homebrew solutions will not be as efficient as recapture, obviously, because the bots get smarter, so you have to combat them in a better ways. So um, yeah, but still, you know, it's it's absolutely fascinating and there's some really cool examples here. And again, you know, I found it to be absolutely interesting that 
Even a tricks that as simple as just doing a hidden form element can combat majority of the bots. That is just very curious. But okay, continuing, we got um, Hacker News threads. Ask Hacker News, old guys, what do you miss about development in 70s, 80s, 90s, and zeros? And you know, it's like a how to make me feel old in one sentence, basically. So apparently if I was working in 90s, I'm already old. So, uh, but <laughs> that's not the thing. So the interesting point here is there's some very interesting comments here. And I just want to highlight one of them, the one that is currently on the top. It says that basically um, thing I miss about the web dev in, in the 90s is the low user expectations. Uh, so the author goes, because I was going to say I miss the simplicity of, of, of all of it, you know, your front end was just HTML, no CSS, only some smidgen of JavaScript for like lightweight form validation. Your back end was just a Perl script with CGI PM running behind Apache that rendered HTML. No React, no Flexbox, no REST API, no microservices, no Docker, no Kubernetes. But the reason it didn't need any of those things is because it had a terrible UI and uh, didn't need, uh, didn't do much at all. And only needed to support trivial number of users whose modems were probably the m main bottleneck anyway. It's a very interesting point because I think that comes down to the, you know, all of those People saying, hey, yeah, we actually was so much simpler back in the 90s. And yes, it was. But I think this nails exactly why it was so much simpler. Because nobody cared about user experience and UIs at all. It was like, you know, you just make a button, you just make a form, and nobody cares how it looks, nobody cares how it works. Nobody cares about proper errors, nobody cares about fallbacks, offline work, and all of the cool stuff that we have right now. And what you basically expect to see in the modern web application, right? Because you didn't ha have to care about that, all of that back then, it was a lot simpler. Of course it was, right? But I honestly, <laughs> I prefer the things modern way, even though this is, you know, it was simpler, but it was not as even close to what we have right now. But anyway, if you are interested in seeing other responses to what do you miss about development in 70s, 80s, 90s, and zeros, do check this thread out. There is quite a lot of very interesting discussion going on. All right, next article we got here is Chromium and the browser monoculture problem. As the author jokes himself, it's a think piece about browser monoculture. And uh, there's a few very interesting points the author actually makes here. So he starts by talking about, so what is exactly browser monoculture? What does it mean? And why is it a problem? And remembering, you know, so basically the, in case you didn't know for some reason, hopefully you do, browser monoculture is when one browser dominates the market so much uh, as to developers stop building the code for web and start building the code for one specific browsers. We've seen that happen when Internet Explorer in 2000s was dominating. We're kind of starting to see that doing, uh, like happening right now with the Chrome, because Chrome is like have 60, 70% of the market share globally. And there's uh, already a set of websites that basically say, we're not going to work in anything but Chrome. Now, um, the other thing the author notes here is that it's actually not Chrome monoculture, but a Chromium monoculture, right? Because it's not just one browser, but a set of browsers that are based on top of Chromium, which is no longer just a browser, but actually a browser, I guess a application framework to be completely fair, right? Because Chromium is not just used for building browsers like Samsung Internet, Opera, Edge, the new one, uh, or Vivaldi, Brave, Epic, whatever you take, they all use Chromium under the hood. But we also have Electron. We also have a Chrome Embedded Framework. We also have like a ton of other uh, application frameworks that are built on top of Chromium. And the author makes uh, an interesting point here that we kind of do have the monoculture, right? But it is not a Chrome monoculture, but rather a Chromium monoculture, and it's not just one browser. And then the author goes into a discussion of like, is it really bad? Because, you know, like at this point, Chromium cannot be viewed as a standalone browser, but rather, again, a framework, like a, a thing that users build on top of, right? And while, yes, Chromium is still in complete control of Google. So Google decides what happens with it. It would be interesting 
So it is a single dominant platform as the author summarizes it here. It would be interesting to see how the whole web would develop. And I mean, it really looks like it's going towards this. Uh, so the crazy idea from the author is basically what if the entire web standardized on a single browser engine? So what if we take Chromium, creates a single Chromium, I don't know, like Chromium Software Foundation or whatever, like the, you know, the Python Foundation, Node.js Foundation, or, I mean, we already have the JavaScript Foundation, right? What was it, OpenJS Foundation. What if we pass the Chromium to that and then we have one standard browser engine? Well, of course, there, there would have the downsides. And again, author discusses that quite a bit here, uh, like the implementation diversity. For example, right now we have the Chrome and Firefox and Safari devs basically competing with each other in terms of optimizations and speeds. And it's, it's, you know, it's a healthy environment essentially, but um, having one standardized way of building browsers could actually save us a lot of headaches. And uh, again, you know, the author doesn't say that this is an ideal way of doing things, it's just a crazy idea, as he says. If the whole discussion sounds very interesting, I would highly recommend reading the article itself. And there is also a very, very lengthy discussion going on in the comments that also has some interesting things going on. So if the whole thing sounds interesting, do check it out. I personally find it to be pretty interesting. Like I, I, you know, as you might imagine, I'm using Chrome as my primary browser. I am thinking of switching to the Edge once it comes out on a stable release because it is a lot faster than Chrome, let's be honest here. Uh, and I guess primarily because, you know, it doesn't have like 90% of the Google crap in it. But hey, um, and I would be absolutely fascinated to see how the web would look if we would have one standardized de facto essentially engine that is controlled by the community that like you know it's kind of like node.js but for the world of browsers that would be very interesting uh, but I, i'm not sure if that's going to happen if, if even google will allow this to happen or will support this or whatever but it's an interesting notion so it's a, it's a very interesting discussion basically all right, continuing, we got the reduce uh, spread pattern, uh, basically reduce, okay, <laughs> how the hell do I read that? The reduce object spread is anti-pattern, right? So the author here argues that using uh, object spread in your reduce function is an anti-pattern. While I don't think I agree with that because this is very much idiomatic JavaScript code, um, the points here are quite valid. So you just have to keep in mind that when using this pattern, you actually increase the complexity of your code quite a bit. So it's no longer on, it's actually on squared, I think, if not more than that, because the spread is an iteration actually, right? So you have to iterate through the object. So this incre increases the complexity and makes your code less performant. Uh, but we're coming again to the same, uh, to the same uh, thing, right? So the same uh, idea that I've been talking about again and again and again, do not optimize something that you don't know is a bottleneck for you, right? So we talked about this a ton of times and yes, okay, the rest reduced spread is O n squared. And yes, it is a lot slower than just about anything else. But is it going to be a problem for you? Likely not unless you have to process an arrays or objects with thousands of properties, and you have to do it in milliseconds. You're not going to have a problem here. Let's be honest, right? And yeah, okay, using I don't know, using um, mutation, just mutable array is O n and it's going to be a lot faster. But again, you know, is it going to be a problem? It's it, like, anyway, the article itself is a really good write up that demonstrates why this is a problem and why this is going to impact your performance. But I please like read it, understand it. It's great. Like the write up is great, but just, you know, don't, pre, don't, don't prematurely optimize your stuff. It's not helpful. And it's just takes your time away from something that could be directed towards something more useful, essentially. So that's all I want to say. Nonetheless, the article is really good. So if you're curious how this spread, object spread works under the hood and how it increases the complexity of your code, do have a look. All right, last article we got here is not exactly um, code related, let's put it this way, but it actually talks about the open source economy. It's from Andre Stoltz and it's called Software Below the Poverty Line. So this is an analysis of the top 
or was it 58? Yes, top 58 open source projects on GitHub and their funding. So the popularity here is very important uh, because if the top 58 projects cannot sustain themselves on the donations they get essentially on the support they get, then you can guess what is going to be from the, you know, less popular projects, for example. Now, there is just two projects out there on GitHub that are sustainable. That is Vue.js and Webpack. Everything else is really bad, basically. Okay, there's like, okay, a couple more projects that are okay-ish in okay-ish range, which is Babel, Mastodon, OBS, Jest, and a bunch of others. But, you know, then again, this is like, uh, this all takes in account uh, just the money that the project makes, not the team size, as far as I understood, right? So it's like re just the yearly revenue. And while the yearly revenue for Webpack and Vue is quite big, but so are the teams that support them. But, you know, if you take the other projects like Prettier, for example, or Ava or Synon or Gatsby or Curl or Beaker or uh, there's Electron, there's a poverty line. Majority of them are below poverty line. And it is, so that means that if the developers who are now building those projects would leave their jobs and do it full time, they will not be able to survive. As simple as that. Uh, the data set is available. Um, on open basically so you can now uh, analyze it on your own if you want to there's also some thoughts and discussion going on about you know what are the alternatives how we can actually uh, solve this problem and uh, you know other things like this anyway it is a very grim picture to be honest uh, like it's just it's just one one more display that open source is not sustainable in its current form for about 99% of the projects, right? So it's like, there are some exceptions, like again, Vue.js, Webpack, maybe Babel, maybe OBS, maybe WebSocket, uh, sorry, Socket.io. But everything else is basically screwed. So if companies who support them, like, you know, Electron is supported by GitHub, and if GitHub decides that they're no longer want to support this, it's, it's just going to disappear likely. Unless there are enough people who are willing to work for free, which is highly unlikely, basically. It's a grim picture, but I don't know. Let's see how open source develops. And I'm just hoping that in the next couple of years, we're gonna see someone figuring out a way to sustain all of that stuff. But nonetheless, you know, if you're interested in this discussion, if you're maintaining some open source projects yourself, do check this out. There is some very interesting things to be, uh, well, main interesting things to think about here, basically. Okay, that is it for the articles and news. Now we're coming to tips, tricks, and bit-sized awesomeness. The first one we got here is the announcement from the Chromium development team uh, with regards to manifest with three changes. So the backlash was big enough uh, for them to change the API from the 30,000 rules per extension to 150k rules, which is better, but still not quite enough. So if I take my uBlock, for example, and look at my filters, I currently have 220k network filters, which is, I mean, 150k is closer to that, but still not enough. And I'm not even using all the filters they have there, I'm just using some of them. And you know, I want more. Like uh, their initial reasoning for the having 30k rules per extension was, hey, we actually want more performance and 30k is like the performance sweet spot. And then they just go and, hey, okay, now we have 150k rules. We, like, if your point was performance, then increasing the rules fivefold will not impact it positively, right? So, like, might as well remove that restriction overall. Because I, yeah. the interesting thing is that the majority of Chromium-based browsers like Opera, Brave, uh, what was it, Vivaldi, and so on and so forth, and they, they said they will be porting the manifest with three without this, uh, uh, God damn it, without this restriction at all. So sounds to me like they have to just drop it. Otherwise people will migrate from the Chromium to something that basically from Chrome, I guess, to something that doesn't have this bullshit because it is just, it seems like it's complete, you know, it's just politics basically at this point. And there's like, if you can increase it fivefold and it won't impact your performance, as you say, then why, why can't you just drop it? Or why can't you set it to, I don't know, half a mil? 
What's the problem with that? It's just so weird. Like at this point, it just seems like a political thing at all. But uh, yeah, there we go. Okay, next thing we got here is the new RFC for Vue.js for function-based component API that actually looks pretty neat. So I want to note that it doesn't look completely functional because you still define your component as an object, uh, but you now, instead of having a bunch of properties like on mount or, you know, on mounted or watch or on unmounted, you have only one function that is a setup that works pretty much the same way the React functional, comp yeah, let me try that again. React functional components do. So you basically define your state, you define computed values, you define watch variables or any life cycles inside of it. And then you return the bindings to the context, which looks a lot cleaner and also allows you to have the custom hooks, which is also quite nice. So if you're using Vue.js and we're curious, do check it out. Next thing we got here is a new addition to React DevTools that uh, is why did this render that literally allows you to record and profile components and then see why exactly did this component render in a pretty detailed way that looks absolutely awesome. So if you're working with React, make sure to check this one out. Next thing we got here is array flat and flat map are now available in Chrome, Firefox, Safari, and Node.js, and you can use them everywhere. And there's a nice link to the article that summarizes on what they do and how to use them if you are curious. Next thing we got here is uh, changes to Chrome incognito modes. Uh, so it's been detectable for years due to file system API implementation. Uh, and this is now fixed as of Chrome 67. So Chrome 67 private mode is no longer detectable and you should be able to use it without exposing yourself on the web, which is quite nice. I still like, here's the thing about the whole, you know, incognito and profiles and everything in Chrome. I still really like the Firefox containers feature and I love, I would love to see something similar in Chrome, but I guess they are, you know, it just doesn't matter for them because they are not as privacy focused as Firefox, but uh, nonetheless, a really nice addition. Right, next thing we got here is a um, tweet that says, apparently JavaScript is awesome, surprise, and as such, it's possible to iterate ranges of numbers using three dot operator. So here's a really neat um, hacky way of doing this, I guess. So you can extend number prototype uh, and add a proxy on top of it so that if you have four const of one three dots nine, it will actually return a generator function that will iterate over it and do it, you know, as if it was Ruby, Python or whatever. And it actually works, which, yeah, I mean, it is, you know, modifying the prototypes is terrifying and please don't do that because they will bring to like this will, this usually ends up either breaking the web like Mutools, I'm looking at you, or um, headaches and debugging, trying to figure out what the hell is going on because this is not a default prototype function and why does this work or not work. But nonetheless, it's a really neat uh, thing. I, I wish they would actually add that to a language. <laughs> if it was this easy to extend, please add this to a language. <laughs> but okay, yeah, it's a really nice exercise anyway. All right, next thing we got here is a promise combinators uh, collection. So um, we got Recently, promise.allsettled and promise.any, there are still proposals, but are, I think, already in uh, late stages. And this blog does a very nice job of basically outlining what all of them do and how and when do you use them, with also outlines the support in different browsers and Node.js and so on and so forth. So if you're curious about them, do check them out. Next thing we got here is React Native Open Source Update from June 2019. A pretty nice write up on the React Native state of the open source, essentially, um, outlining the community contributions, including a new screen app, turbo module types, and uh, Lean Core updates, which seems to be progressing quite nicely. There's also a bunch of user feedback requests. So, if you're curious, basically, if you're working with React Native, I would recommend just reading through that. There is a lot of useful information here. Next thing we got here is the uh, introducing a new content delivery network for modern JavaScript. It's a Pika CDN and allows you to import ES modules directly from it, which works perfectly fine. So if you are working with ESM, if you want to work without 
compiling anything and you just want to import stuff from the web, now you can do it with Pika KDN. Uh, CDN, they also have this uh, really nice pika.dev website that allows you to search for stuff and, and, you know, directly import it from here, which is really handy. So there we go. All right. Uh, next thing we got here is the state of GraphQL by Reddit. A uh, really neat, I thought, uh, I mean, I wouldn't call it an article, but a collection of a comments from Reddit on different technologies, like general review of GraphQL states from different people who are basically using it in production or using it in uh, different environments, specific topics like big boys in GraphQL uh, or data fetching or caching. So if you are evaluating GraphQL or you're just curious about the state of it from the people using it on Reddit, I guess, you know, take it with a grain of salt as usual. And do check it out. There are some interesting things here. Okay, and the last, is it the last thing or no? No, it is not the last. Yes, it is the last thing we got here is the uh, pull request to Node.js that is aimed to port RemRAF package to core, uh, which is a notion that I personally welcome wholeheartedly. So if you never heard about it, RemRAF is a really nice uh, node package that allows you to remove RMRF, essentially the folders because, you know, doing it manually in Node is a bit of a pain in the ass. And it's not just a package that does it in a nice command, but it actually like contains a ton of uh, workarounds and fixes for different operating systems and problems and so on and so forth. And the idea is to just include it into the Node core to make it nicer. Uh, I honestly, I would love to see more utils like this port it into the core to make it better and, you know, to essentially allow me not to import ton of things from third party libraries, but to just rather use core. So yes, if you are curious do check it out, honestly, quite excited about that. We'll see how that progresses. Okay, now we are coming to the releases section. The first release of the week is styled components version five that comes with a 90% smaller bundle, 18% faster client side mounting, 17% faster updates of dynamic styles and 45% faster server side rendering. It also adds REL support and has no breaking changes. So make sure to update. Looks absolutely awesome and uh, is, has been rewritten to use the hooks under the hood uh, for basically, I guess this is what brings the speed ups. It's very curious. So anyway, do check it out. If you're using style components, make sure to update. Next thing we got here is Stencil version 1.0, which is also dubbed Stencil 1. We already talked about it quite a few times. It's a tool set for using web components. So make sure to check it out, uh, the release version, if that sounds interesting. Next thing we got here is Atom version 138, bringing you some GitHub package improvements, improvements to JS, JS ERB, and Python language grammars. Tricitor parsing support for JSON, and that's basically it. Again, you know, I've already mentioned it more than once, but Atom release notes look completely boring compared to VS Code. And again, I'm not sure what the future will be for it since both are now owned by Microsoft, but we've been discussing this for, I think every time I see Atom notes. So let's, let's just stop with this, okay? All right, continuing, we got React Redux version 7.1.0 with hooks. Finally, the hooks are here. Now you can use them. They are stable, they are released. So if you're using React Redux, make sure to update. And if you want, you can now switch to hooks. Next release we got here is ViewPress version 1.0. If you never heard about ViewPress, it's a static site generator. It is actually really nice and view powered. So if you ever wanted to do a static website, but was thinking about pick, picking a tool, I guess, then do check this one out. It's actually really easy to use and very nice to, um, set up. So it was quite straightforward for me at least. Okay, next release we got here is React Native version 0.60 release candidate one. So this is a release candidate It is not yet stable. But again, you know, if you want to try it out, do try it out. The major highlights is Android X supports uh, removal of web view and geolocation because of the link core initiative, they are moved into separate packages. Um, and you can now nest views within the text components, which is something that people have been asking for ages, I think. The cool thing is that you also now have Cocoa Pods integrated by default, and there's a bunch of other stuff which also looks interesting. So I cannot wait for the 60 stable release uh, because it actually looks quite exciting. 
All right, and the last release we got here is WebHint's uh, browser extension for Firefox and Chrome. You can now install it and get the um, report for your website that basically hints you on things you can improve. It's sort of like Lighthouse, but a bit differently with more things. So Lighthouse just does the, you know, the progressive web app uh, reports while WebHint does a lot of stuff like accessibility, compatibility, pitfalls, security issues, and stuff like this. So if you're working with websites, make sure to check it out. This might help you quite a bit on making your website better. And not, it not just does not just highlight the problem, it also shows you what you can do to solve it, which is also quite awesome. All right, now we are coming to the libraries and demos section. The first library we got here today is Restated. An amb ambitiously tiny gzipped, uh, there's also a typo over here, 900 bytes flukes-like library to manage your states. Which, um, so this uh, side note immediately doesn't mention it anywhere, but the library itself uses proxy to wrap the store. So it will not work in the older browsers that do not support proxy. But uh, the way it works is actually super straightforward. So the idea is that you use the restated to wrap an object that will be your state that has the functions that modify it. And then you just use that store anywhere you want, right? So you can actually get the properties from the store, read them normally as if you would with a normal object, but you cannot set them anywhere but within the setters that you define within your initial object because the proxy prevents that. The other cool thing is it also, also supports chainable methods and stuff like this. So I guess, you know, if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Again, keep in mind that it is a proxy based thing, so it will not work in all the browsers. Uh, next thing we got here is Threads.js, an easy to use yet powerful multi-threading library for Node.js in the browser. A really nice abstraction that basically allows you to work with uh, worker, web worker, or child process transparently. ES6 and backwards compatible and uh, contains the thread pool, error handling, works on client and on server. Again, works with older node versions through the child process if you want to. Looks very neat. So if you wanna work with threads and you need to support a variety of environments and maybe you wanted thread pools or stuff like this, do check it out. It seems to be quite nifty. So it seems to provide all the features you might ever want. Next thing we got here is JavaScript questions, a long list of advanced JavaScript questions and their explanations updated weekly. Has uh, some typical questions that you would see in the, um, I guess, questions, you know, during the, um, God damn it, I forgot the name of it. During the job interviews is what I want to say and the answers and explanations of what exactly happens in them and how you should answer to them. Majority of them are I'm a more or less straightforward. Some of them are quite tricky. Some of them are interesting. Others are boring. But if you are just starting with JavaScript or maybe if you're looking for a job and wanted to refresh your knowledge, then do check it out. There's some uh, good stuff in here. Next thing we got here is React Leaflet, a React component for leaflet maps. If you ever needed to render leaflet maps in your React components, now I can do it in a pretty straightforward way, including markers, pop-ups, and all that kind of stuff as React components. I mean, Leaflet is not incredibly hard to render in React just you know without using any wrappers, but this does make it quite a bit nicer. So do check it out if you're working with maps. Next thing we got here is use debounce, a debounce hook for React. A very straightforward debounce hook that you might want to use or maybe not. I mean, if you do, then do check it out. Seems to be very simple, but uh, maybe helpful to you. All right, next thing we got here is React Resize Detector, a cross-browser event-based element resize detector for React that seems to handle a lot of edge cases for different browsers. So if you're working with uh, things that have to react to resizing, do check it out. Maybe this will help you. Next thing we got here is React Teleporter, a React uh, teleports React components in the same React tree. So the gist is super simple. You allows uh, basically you define the target and then you can use the source to change the target from other components, which in this case, for example, they set the status uh, to loading in the header from the page itself, which I guess can be helpful in quite a few cases. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. 
Next thing we got here is two packages for new Apple authentication with Node.js. The first one is Apple Auth, that is just a sign in standalone one that allows you to work with Apple Auth uh, from well any code you want. And the other one is the extension of the previous package that is Passport Apple that allows you to log in uh, for Apple using Passport JS. So if you're working with Apple apps and you needed to do the Apple sign in, now you can do it quite easily. So do check it out. Right. Next thing we got here is Lebab. Um, I, I, like, I, I honestly don't know how to read that. I know it's a Babel other, you know, reversed Babel basically. And it's exactly what it does. It takes your ES5 code and turns it into a readable ES6 code. So if you wanted to modernize your very old code base and we're looking for a tool to do that, well, now you can. There's still a ton of to-dos here, but it actually has been around for quite some time and seems to do a quite decent job in modernizing code. So if that sounds interesting. Do check it out. All right, next thing we got here is readme MD generator, a command line that generates beautiful readme files for you by, you know, you just run it and then answer a few questions. And uh, then you just got a very nice readme like the one that the package itself has. So if you're too lazy to write your readmes yourself, then this might help you. So check this one out. Next thing we got here is chessboard.js, a JavaScript chessboard that allows you to render chessboards and uh, interact with them and do things. And you know, you can literally do anything you want. There is a ton of things you can do with it. It also supports animations and everything. It looks very, very neat. Uh, so if you are into chess and you want to do some chess visualizations, then this one actually looks quite nice. Uh, so there you go. Seems to be quite easy to use, honestly. All right, last demo we got here today is npm fs, a JavaScript package inspector that allows you to view diff and deep link packages. I think the diff feature is the most interesting one. So you can literally say, okay, here, here we have a Lodash. I want to know what actually changed uh, between the Lodash 4.17 and the previous version. And we'll literally div the whole three and you will see all the changes that happened in the package which is can be quite handy. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out seems incredibly useful. And there's a lot of other features that it provides um, seems like might be an invaluable tool when working with MPM. Okay, that is it for the libraries and demos very tiny today. The last thing I want to highlight is the new um, Gua gun web app that is um, allows you to draw or I guess outline is more, you know, precise um, term outline the picture that you want to look or you want to draw, I guess. So here we get some rocks and then we're going to draw some C on top. Come on. Come on, just draw. There we go. Some C. And then we're going to have some sky. I don't know. Is that Yeah, that is sky, right? And then you can just select a style. And this will generate um, using the neural networks, it will generate a nicely looking image, which also supports a bunch of other styles. So you like it using the style transfer. You can produce some really trippy stuff with that, especially if you go like, okay, we got a plant and then we can just draw it like this, which, you know, is not exactly what something you would normally see, but actually tries to produce something that is relevant. <laughs> which can be absolutely hilarious. So um, do play around with it. It is actually extremely fun. All right. That is actually it for today. So this was BXJS weekly episode 67. As usual, you can find all the links mentioned on bxjs.dev or on GitHub. Um, if you guys have any questions or suggestions in watching this right now, feel free to throw them into the chat. If not, then I guess we can finish this here and go have a um, nice rest of the weekend. Uh, what can I say? Yes, we have an awesome discord community. So if you are interested in talking about JavaScript or video games, do join us. Uh, we have a nice cozy server. Um, if you want to share your projects or highlight something that you think I might have missed, feel free to send it my way using Twitter, Twitch, Discord, whatever the hell you want. As usual, if you missed it, the VOD will be available immediately on Twitch or on YouTube. Seems like there is no questions or suggestions. So thank you guys very much for watching. Thank you for your continued support. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Yeah, have an awesome rest of the weekend or rest of the week if you're watching a VOD for this. And I see you next time. Bye.